Um, all right. So, oh. <laughs> um, morning, everyone. Welcome back to No Time to Wait, uh, day two of this wonderful conference. Um, so we have uh, another uh, great session for you this morning of speakers, and we're going to kick things off with Dave Rice, who's going to talk, uh, talk to us about how No Time to Wait uh, all happens. Take it away, Dave. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm not sure if I would count this amongst the great presentations we have this morning. Uh, do you mind uh, turning off the headphones? <clears throat> so uh, I think at the last maybe five No Time to Wait, I gave this presentation at the beginning of the last day. Um, and this is just to go over like how No Time to Wait happens, how we make this conference, and to provide thank yous and I don't know, just so we get the right amount of support from people, we want you to know how, how we do this um, and welcome your advice on how to do this in the future. <clears throat> so I think I just use the same slide every year because in general, um, the way to get this conference to happen is a mix of the contribution of time, money, and, and love. Uh, we definitely need all of these in order to pull off this uh, event. <clears throat> so I wanted to go back and show our budgets for the last couple of years. So no time to wait five. Uh, we ended up getting a, a sponsorship from, from these various institutions. Initially, um, the no time to wait conference was funded by the Performa project exclusively. In, in that, we had uh, 5,000 euro that was supposed to be used to develop a public workshop and we would just use that to run the first two iterations of the conference. Uh, once that project ended, we didn't have access to that funding source anymore, but um, there was enough encouragement and support from the community um, that we were able to uh, work with these sponsors to support the continuation of the, the conference. So um, we had this wonderful list of sponsors supporting us for No Time to Wait 5, <clears throat> which was, I think, in 2021 during the Omicron outbreak. So if you might remember what happened, um, that entire conference went online, and that's when we moved to Gather Town, um, which in a lot of ways reduced our expenses because we had raised all this money, and a lot of our um, budget goes to running a social dinner like last night and travel grants, which weren't so relevant when we were uh, having to move fully online. So um, because of that, we had like a large outstanding budget from No Time to Wait 5, this uh, 4,400 euro that we were able to carry over to the next one. <clears throat> so next, No Time to Wait 6 was in The Hague last year. Uh, we get, <clears throat> sorry for my voice, we got a little bit of additional funding from these sources for a total of uh, 7,100. <clears throat> and then finally for No Time to Wait 7, this is our list of um, financial sponsors. Um, I have the DPC listed in here, but it's a bit of an indirect sponsor. They, the way they contributed to No Time to Wait was in travel grants, but they would distribute the travel grant directly to the recipient. Um, we have these other sources, uh, we collected 6,900, added to the 2,000 euro we had from last year, and had a total of 8,900 euro to uh, run this conference. So this is how we spend our money. Um, we spent 3,000 euro on travel grants, which I think was substantially more than we did before. Highest ever. The highest ever. Um, so uh, congrats to the folks that we were able to help support in getting here. Um, you know, we think obviously like in attending a conference, like when you consider the total costs of all the participants involved, like our culminate of travel is a substantial one. Like when, oh, you're so kind to me. I'll add this to my other glass of water over here. <laughs> Um, so, so travel grants help support bringing more voices and more participation to the conference. Um, the printing is just for the program you see, um, the signature sheets, um, I don't know, a couple of the other signage, and then we have our badges. For organizer travel and lodging, there's uh, four people in the organizing committee, and we cover our own travel and our flights in our hotel. And then last night, the dinner initially was supposed to be 1,800 euro, but I think we drank a little more than we expected to, so it was 1,900 euro. <clears throat> so um, we had raised 8,900 and spent 7,900. So this is what it looks like uh, going forward for us. Um, we have 1,000 euro to bring into next year, and uh, we still love our sponsors so much, so like have to sort of go about fundraising for next year. 
I don't know, Alison, did you want to share comments for next year in particular, or do it later? Yeah. <coughs> um, might be worthwhile doing it now. Oh, yes. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks for coming this morning. Yeah, so we are really uh, dependent on you, not only as um, contributors to the community in terms of participating to documentation writing, just contributing, just being involved, sharing your practices and knowledges, but we're also kind of dependent on you supporting um, No Time to Wait in this community, financially speaking, with your dollars, euros, yens, um, kronas, any, any, any monetary. Uh, so we uh, would, I'm going to make an honest and open appeal if you can speak to your organizations, to your leadership about supporting n No Time to Wait, please do so. It doesn't have to be a, a big amount. Um, 100 years, 500 years go a really, really long way. Um, uh, so in order for us to keep this conference open and free and provide you with social events and provide you with... Uh, with, with the spaces and, and all this wonderful community for coming together, we really are dependent on everybody here, even financially speaking. Um, so again, um, if you can speak to your leadership, if you know of any schemes that we can apply to, please uh, let us know. We've had, I'm gonna be very open and transparent again, uh, two of our big uh, sponsors that we're very grateful for can no longer go forward. So there's gonna be um, a, a hole in our budget for next year. So talking about next year, um, this is also, an, uh, some of you may have already heard, usually at the end of this conference, we uh, let you know where the next conference is, is going to be. Unfortunately, this year we cannot do that because uh, we had an institution in mind, but that fell through, unfortunately. And so we're also making an, an appeal to you if you could host us next year. Um, please let us know. We can talk about what it means in terms of uh, resources, in-kind resources, but also financial resources. And we're also very, very grateful for, uh, for those institutions uh, to host us. We're also happy to, to come to these institutions. We believe that it's also good for them that we come to you. We bring the entire community, we bring the knowledge, we bring the fun. Um, so yeah, if, you, if you're interested, I mean, we can talk more about it later. Just come and speak to Dave and I about what it actually, actually means. And there again, we're really, um, yeah, relying on people's generosity. And um, yeah, so thank you so much. And uh, I think that's it for our sponsors. Yeah, and no. So, <clears throat> As I really spoke to the money part, about the time part, I wanted to thank uh, Media Area for so much of the coordination, administrative support, and time. Um, <coughs> sorry. Um, our host uh, institution here obviously provided us this wonderful space, technical support. Um, I should have added, like, they added the catering, so, like, the pumpkin soup, the sandwiches, um, and just so much of their time. It was, like, a, a year of us meeting and planning behind the scenes. And then obviously, like we have our organizi organizers, our speakers, and our volunteers offering us so much time. And then all of us are offering, you know, tweets, encouragement to one another, notes, um, and then just love for the community. So like all these are pretty essential uses of time to support the conference. Uh, and this is, Alexander spoke to a little bit. Um, I don't know if we have a few more minutes, but like Alexander and I could speak to any questions about how this conference runs, if you like. Um, you're the stage corner, so you gotta call on yourself. <laughs> like. <laughs> Can you say a bit more about how an institution becomes a sponsor? Um, well, you can you can express your interest with us, and then we can sort of informally uh, discuss it. We have a but how we also have a Google a, a Google questionnaire, I guess, where very basic first questions or are are laid out so that the host institution understands what it is that we are expecting. <laughs> Sorry, we're closing. Um, what it is that we are expecting. Um, so if I can just summarize, it's basically, uh, we would need a room. Uh, our workshop day is getting bigger, so we would also, uh, I think, add having breakout rooms, having other, other rooms we could um, use a technical setup. I mean, we come with our live streaming. However, if we have technical assistance or um, equipment within that institution that'd be that'd be great, and then of course it's the uh, lunches and the and the and the coffee breaks that is being that is that is kind of the 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 resources we would you know ask for from the host institution. 
The social dinner is purely run by sponsorship, so we always uh, try to find sponsors for the social dinner, particularly, uh, as well as the, the travel grants. Same with the travel grants. Travel grants are very open, so um, each institution can decide if they go to very specific people, if it's very general, if they're students or not. Um, and then we assign them also on a, on, a, on, on a different basis. So I think that's, yeah, so come speak to us. We, can, we, we, sh we will share the Google Drive link if you want to have a look at what it means to host, and then we can go into, into deeper conversation. You could also reach out to other hosts to gauge what their involvement was. I think that also helps. Some are here. Yeah. Some are here. Are there any other questions for Alessandra and Dave before we move on? Yes, Erwin. When you're looking for hosts, does it have to be a European one? No, it doesn't have to be a European one, but um, just so that, because of, I mean, you've seen our budgets, they're not big, um, and we love everybody, and we love every country, um, you know, but um, we are also very mindful about what it means to travel to certain places, certain countries, so not every city is affordable, not every city is easily reachable, so if we organize a conference, I don't know, I'm gonna say Gestadt in Switzerland, um, it, there, it's a different budget than if we say, oh, we're going to, uh, to I don't know, Bologna in Italy. Those are different. Um, so the Bologna in Italy, I know, I've been thinking about how to get the university involved there. Um, the point is, is that we're very, very mindful. We can go to any country, but it would also involve us then doing more uh, outreach, more getting more sponsor, more sponsorship. But we are happy to come to you wherever you are. Um, depending on where you are, we just need to raise way more funds because we want to make it accessible. We want to increase the travel grants in that case, and we want to be able to give you a fun social dinner where you can have maybe three drinks next time, everybody. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. We're very mindful because it helps us as well. You know, if our costs are low for traveling, then it benefits all of you too. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Dave and Alessandra. So next, we're going to have a block of lightning talks from our host institution. And we're going to start things off with Ladislav Suber, who's going to be speaking to us on the topic of film model preparation of a new cataloging system. Can you hear us in here? Can you see it? And these are my waters. I don't know if you want them. I might need somebody else's help. He needs a uh, presenter view. You did this yesterday, right? Yeah, we did this yesterday. Yeah, we did this yesterday. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Oh. Thanks, Kate. Thank you, Kate. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
paper card catalogs uh, for posters, photos with basic evidence, and also for film materials as on the item level, which has a more detailed information, and we also use Google Sheets like for oral history recordings. This is an example of our paper card catalog of photographs. And uh, yes, this card shows the most basic description, including the name of the film the photograph is related to, accession numbers, and the number of items of the same content. Yes, and the film model uh, is the working title for our upcoming cataloging system. It will be developed in cooperation with a software development company, and we are preparing a public tender for it. Film model will be designed as a collection of independent modules that communicate with each other using application programming interface. It gives us a bit of freedom to combine it with new and new models. It will encompass uh, cataloging film and other moving image work as well as posters, photography, and oral history interviews. And we will add some other things in the future like sound materials. Additional, it will be used for creating authority records, mainly for persons and companies, as well as event records as acquisition and preservation events. Uh, the cataloging and search module and the authorities models will be developed by a software company, while the rest will be handled by our archive. So there are some technological requirements outlined on the slide. As you can see, use of open source Software technologies is prerequisite for film model. There will be no proprietary thing in it. Uh, we will develop uh, uh, modules sequentially, one after another, starting with authorities module. With each module's development, we will maintain the following workflow. The metadata specification will be output of our metadata task forces, which are already working. We will adhere to international standards while adding additional elements to it because these standards usually have a core elements and you have to add the elements which you need, which are not there. Metadata module means basically a database and application programming inter interface. And uh, th there's a maybe interesting step that uh, before making cataloging module, we will make search module. It's for displaying and uh, searching the record, sorry. Uh, because during the development the, uh, the period, the search module will have a specific function serving as user-friendly tool for presenting records after migrating for legacy systems to the new metadata scheme. In this way, our catalogers can access the success of migration and provide big feedback on metadata specification. These comments will guide modification to migration mapping and maybe also possibly to extension or revision of initial metadata specification. Because basically metadata specification is a Google Sheets and uh, uh, it's important that users can see it uh, in some better graphical uh, proportion. Uh, yes, and there is also a, uh, the last step will be to make some uh, template XSD for each entity in order we can uh, these data share with other archives and ex or export them. Yes. So this is one of the standard we are rely on. I guess you all know them. It's a filmographic standard, uh, European Film Description Standard, which was later adopted by FIAF in the Film Cataloging Manual. And this is a well-known bibliographical standard we also use for film-related materials. So the authority module will be the first module we will develop. Uh, authority metadata specification will not be based on MARC, but it will be based on ISAR and on the Czech implementation of ISAR, uh, Archival Standard for Authority Records, which is actually issued by Ministry of Interior of Czech Republic as a part of official archival description standard. Archival description in our country is mandated by Ministry of Interior. Authority module will encompass mainly records of agents, which are persons and companies connected to films, posters, photographs, and other related entities. A significant decision was taken to prioritize the development of the authorities module as the initial component of the film model. This choice was guided by the principle that a single agent record could serve across all other modules. For example, actor featured in a film described in moving image mode module could be also relevant in the poster module 
where they might function as a subject from the content, so actor is on the, on the poster, or in oral history uh, module, if actor plays the role as a narrator. Yes, on the contrary, uh, in the case of photographs, we opted for simple structure just with two hierarchical levels, work and item. In this context, expression or variant and manifestation levels are not applicable. Regarding the analytic description, we employ a file level. That doesn't mean computer file, but it's a file in the archival description meaning, which encompasses a set of photos stored within the single paper files. We have almost half a million of photos, and they are stored in these files. And the most of information, especially about photographs, are only on the level of the file. They are written on the file. So we do not know uh, exactly which photographer uh, was ordered or given a photo, but we know the set of the photographers. Yes, and this is our roadmap. Uh, we will, as I said, we will develop one model after each other. Outer disease modules, events module, uh, film module for moving image works, posters module, photos module. XML scheme at the end, and uh, there will be harmonization transition phase. And uh, it's hard to say well when we will create the first cataloging record, possibly after the third module, but uh, we will see it, uh, how it is all going. Uh, so I believe we will succeed in the endeavor to create an open source system we could uh, provide to others also. If we don't, well, we have tried. Thank you for attention. <laughs> Thanks for your presentation. Does anyone have any questions? Oh, yeah. Uh, can you say a little bit more about the, on what basis you selected given standards? Because what I know is in the film archive community, there is a thousand of standards, and everybody claimed that the, his sound standard is the best one. So if you can say something more, uh, uh, how you exactly uh, selected the standards you want to work on. Thank you. Yes, so we, as the film archive, we started with this standard, with, uh, which is uh, in the field of cataloging manual. We decided to, uh, to use uh, four level hierarchy, the full, full implementation of the standard. And we also uh, were looking at this standard. But both are conceptual standards, like for uh, hierarchy description levels and to some extent to analytic uh, description level, but uh, they are just core metadata. So there are some metadata which we have to, uh, that there were no, uh, no other standards I'm aware of where, where we could take on some specific technical metadata which we are using. But this is the core, uh, this, these are the core standards. For the auto rec records, there is a mar mark standards, but we are using ISAR standard and uh, yeah. And I would say this is the basics, as we can also look for, for some mark, uh, uh, mark bibliographic description fields. But basically, for instance, for oral history a module, we have to develop the most of the metadata are nowhere. There is no standard of it, and we have to, we have to think about the, which elements to use. And uh, even if there is no standard, you can always do something called atomization that you can uh, split uh, the element to the, s uh, to the smallest possible element. And then it's very highly probable that it will be mapped, you can map it to any existing standard in this way. Is it interoperable with Europeana or other archives? Uh, oh yeah, no, uh, we are not thinking about Europeana at this point and maybe in future uh, with other. <laughs> Yeah, our film archive community, if there will be uh, some uh, interoperability standard, I think that uh, Paul and the uh, LOD team I'm also in is working on core metadata on ontology, the, the minimum set of metadata which can be interchangeable. But I think this is as far as we can get the minimum. Great, thank you. Um, Aaron, did you have a question? Um, thank you for showing this. Um, I was curious because you say you're going to do a tender for the new system, but I also saw that you, uh, you you were very specific about the languages that would have to be used, the programming languages. Is that for a specific reason? Is that for, for maintenance reason? Or is that why was that so, so, so specified at this point? Well, this is our style. We have digital laboratory who has this uh, 
prescription for which open source technology to use. They have a huge experience with this. So we want to, uh, yes, we want uh, to, to have this prescriptive mode for the tender. But there's also written in tender if uh, the software company knows about some better technology, he, uh, it could tell us and we will discuss it. But we believe these are the best at the, at the moment and for our interval operability. Great, thanks for your presentation. Oh, uh, we'll have one more quick question before moving on to our next one. Thank you. Uh, let me go back to the uh, metadata model structure. I hope it could be mapped to Mark 21. It's to the core of the metadata structure. Yeah? Yes. Uh, some elements probably, yeah. But yeah, just okay. Some elements, okay. I would it's say. It's enough for me. Yeah. yeah. And uh, another question, what about the model for for music? No. We do not have much for music, but we will have module for sound recordings. We have sound recordings on magnetic tapes, and there will be also module uh, for it. But we do not have for music. Thank you. Great, thank you. So next we'll hear from Adela Kudla, aiming for P2P approach in memory institutions. Hello, I'm Adela Kudla. I'm uh, the head of the digital laboratory in uh, Národní filmový archiv. And uh, as I've been in the manager position since a couple of last years, uh, I just participate on projects. I don't really, uh, I just participate on them. I don't have such a, a huge project as everyone is going to present today. Um, so, I have a lightning talk uh, on aiming for peer-to-peer -peer approach in memory institutions and public participation in archiving and preservation of digital art. Um, so, here we go. So, first, uh, when I has had my first my very first moment working at National Film Archive, uh, I kind of realized how big the potential of the materials and the collection is. Unimaginable. Uh, so my first feeling was, everyone has to see, see this, has to know about this. Uh, we need to share, we need to display everything now. Not very handy with the presentation, sorry. And to my disappointment, that did not happen uh, as fast. And I had to learn about the healthy boundaries of ways how we can share the heritage and knowledge that we care about. So, um, since then, uh, NFA and the Digital Laboratory cooperated on several projects. I stated just a couple of them here in this presentation, which will be shared. So everyone can go uh, to, the, to the links and see what we've been participating on. Uh, so Video Archive is one of them. 
Uh, then there is this amazing uh, data providing certified storage project. And for instance, also this project Victor E, which is the visual culture of trauma. And um, yeah, everyone can have a look at this. But this is not my point. This is just a couple of projects we've been putting on public display. And this is also our YouTube channel where you can see a lot of the Czech movies. Uh, but, as I, as I understood, how much time, expertise and money uh, does the work of an archivist take? I felt like a fish in the data sea. So much to digitize, so much to research, but even the part that we already digitized was not permanently on display. Because, yeah, institutions have their limits. And uh, so we find that man's real function is, is sorting out his experience, developing what we call the normally and being useful. We hear people talk about technology as something very threatening but we are technology, the universe is technology, as Buck Buckminster Fuller said. Very wise, very wise words. <laughs> um, culture in general is not a product of individual creator. Uh, it emerges in like a field uh, where uh, an environment that might be defined by its, by its aspects. It carries a message about an era, time and space, about the politics, aesthetics, and many more messages that speak uh, not only about the individual themselves, but about the field they have been influenced by. So, hence, the cultural value is tremendously important for all the participants, meaning general public, other artists, uh, but it also changes the field by being present. So, who do we consider our peers? Is it other archives, museums, is it other states, universities, individuals, students? You see, archiving has always been both institutional and public practice. Uh, much of the collections curated by the institutions are and always have been acquired from uh, private collections, private family collections. And as art pieces of whole collections go digital, and especially born digital, those become established in public institutions. As the range and amount of digital components used in the contemporary art pieces widens, so must the knowledge needed for their preservation for future generations. So I have this idea of sharing. The individuals, communities, states, institutions, as I mentioned before, the wide, de wide range of different groups can not only access, but also participate in the care for the heritage. With their storage, with their knowledge, with their expertise, I would like to think how we can before if we should or should not. Yeah, so here I'm 
stating just one idea how we might distribute the heaviness of the care amongst all who are interested in taking part of it. And I hope there will be discussion, not questions, discussion. <laughs> Thank you. Here, one second. Try Here's me. The mic. Uh, there is a specific uh, thing for a former socialistic country, name it uh, uh, Amateur Cinema Club. I guess that this exists as existed as well in uh, Czech Republic. And they have a huge uh, heritage on 16 millimeter, which is pure amateur, but amateur uh, feature films, let's say. Mm -hmm. Uh, who care about that now, uh, you or some other institution? Who, because uh, right now, uh, the, those, most of those clubs doesn't exist and maybe their heritage is kind of orphan. So who care about these clubs? Thank you. Thank you for the question. So uh, in the Narodny Filmový Archive, we do have a collection of amateur film. Uh, we're, we're actually going to hear a presentation about a specific project that is mostly uh, mostly taking care of this kind of collection. And um, yeah, like up, up to date, we still do collect uh, amateur film. Uh, the National Film Archive participates in Home Movie Day every year where people bring um, their home tapes and their ancestors' tapes, uh, and we we store them, we collect them, and then uh, as a value to give back, we we digitize it for them, so they have uh, something at hand from their own heritage, family heritage. Great, thank you. Um, I think we have time for another question. Does anyone have anything they want to ask Adela? Yeah. Thank you for your presentation. I think it's a really interesting idea and I was wondering, do you have already some experience with sharing, um, I don't know, the, the information or knowledge that your users have about the collections or about the the films you have shared, um, and yeah, if you have some experience with it. So, uh, me personally, as um, just for you to understand, I started in the archive uh, on board digital acquisitions. So, uh, mostly this would be there, there were some partial things, partial uh, pieces uh, that would be, say, a little more complicated than a film, uh, born digital movie, uh, either DCP, MP4, whatever format uh, they would have at hand. Uh, so I didn't come into such, I didn't have such an opportunity to. Uh, share the knowledge of the people, of the artists who made the artwork. Uh, but yeah, there were a couple of pieces where there would be some explanation needed. And uh, those projects uh, which are in the presentation, which we didn't really go farther into, I strongly recommend you open the presentation and the links because those are uh, terrific uh, archivist works amongst uh, different communities. So, for instance, the video archive uh, project, uh, there have been several uh, interviews with the artists and collection of um, other materials than, than just the work, the core work itself. Great, thank you. Can we get a round of applause for Adela? So next we'll hear from 
Daria Cherniak and Zdenek uh, Reyes, Reynish, sorry, tagging the overscanned digitized analog film with film type and edge marks metadata. Hi, just, oh God. Um, so just um, an update from, for the program today as they're figuring this out. Uh, the, uh, the 1440 talk is actually, today is gonna be from Yannicka van Dalen on uh, the wonderful project, Share Your Knowledge. So yeah, so this is the program update uh, for today.
Yeah. Okay, and an update from Radislav. Uh, his presentation today at 11.10 is gonna be a lightning talk, more than a presentation. Any other updates I need to know at this point uh, while we're here? <laughs> oh, again, one more from Radislav. Uh, like okay, yeah, you have 20 minutes. Yeah, yeah, all good. I'm just gonna do some housekeeping. Like yesterday, coffee and snacks for the break are outside and uh, as well as lunch. Generously provided by our host. Uh, also, please consider uh, contributing to the notes, collaborative notes. Thank you, Randy for, uh, and Yvonne for, and for pulling all that work. We know it's a lot. We appreciate it, thank you. Yes, once we have everything edited and uh, everything will be made available on the YouTube channel. Oh, the slides? Um, yeah, probably. We'd have to double check on that, but yeah. So sorry for the delay. Um, my name is uh, Daria Cherniak, uh, and this is my colleague Daniel Krinish. Uh, we work at the Digital laboratory, laboratory at the National Film Archive Prague. Uh, we would like to present you briefly our project we're working on. It's uh, um, uh, dig uh, digitization of uh, nine and a half uh, millimeter film collection, uh, and. Yeah, uh, so like it's our uh, testing uh, pilot project for uh, uh, to implement in the OIS archive uh, packages system, and but the project itself uh, is uh, dedicated to the um, uh, 100 annual of the uh, nine and a half millimeter format, uh, and uh, more specifically to the uh, to the uh, Pate uh, Amateur uh, Club, uh, which was based in Prague in the 1930s. Uh, where uh, they shared uh, their practices uh, and uh, uh, in their periodical, uh, which is called Pate Review. And yeah, so like it's uh, the, uh, I think, a precise description of uh, what were they uh, doing uh, in a way. Um, okay, so we had a video here. <laughs> Okay. Okay. So the videos won't work uh, because of this. Uh, this. Um, ah, it's a pity. So we'll have to improvise. Yeah, so like, um, uh, unlike the common usage of, uh, of um, reversal film stock for the amateur, uh, amateur films uh, and uh, home, uh, home movie films, uh, they widely used uh, the, uh, the negative-positive process. 
And uh, uh, here was a beautiful uh, video made by my colleagues Danny Greenish where uh, you could see the different uh, different uh, film tricks. Uh, there were uh, simple, but uh, like uh, for example, you had uh, the um, uh, in, how to say the uh, inter, inter no. <laughs> okay sorry <laughs> uh, yeah like uh, yeah like they used uh, some transitions uh, through uh, through the circle or through the um, uh, I don't know like uh, something like a curtain uh, so, yeah so they uh, printed they uh, um, uh, uh, they shot it uh, uh, separately, and then they printed on the from negative to positive uh, film stock. So there will be so many few <laughs> of, of, of videos. Uh, yeah, but uh, like in an overscan, scan, we uh, we've noticed that, and you can see it here, uh, maybe here, but we noticed some uh, some information which was. Uh, which was shown like uh, uh, in 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 the space between perforation, uh, so uh, it was uh, uh, it was clear that uh, they used uh, different techniques, not like only reversible film, but like uh, as I said, uh, negative process and uh, positive process process. Uh, but um, but also we've noticed some uh, edge marks, which we decided to uh, which we decided to. Also keep uh, and to uh, research uh, in in uh, in like a bit further, but uh, yeah. So uh, so we for our archival packages we keep both uh, uh, like uh, overscan and the master. And I give the word to Zdenek who is uh, doing that uh, that uh, work, and I will return with uh, uh, notification of edge marks. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, I shall uh, sh uh, shortly describe the uh, digitalization process. Uh, we are scanning a 9.5 millimeter film uh, on the film uh, fabric scanner. Uh, it's our main device uh, in this work. Uh, we use it uh, uh, like a flat table for screening the films uh, and for measuring the length of the films. The film scanner uh, doesn't export uh, much of its scanning metadata, so we write it manually and uh, our project Excel sheet uh, and to the conservation report. Um, we, we scan film uh, as DPX file and then using raw cooked, we compress them to Matryoshka. Uh, we use it uh, 16 frames per second uh, as a standard for 9.5 millimeter films uh, based uh, on research. Uh, that's uh, research. Uh, uh, the most of cameras had 16 frames per second options um, uh, and the projectors didn't, didn't have frame per, per second options at all. Uh, the film is quite small and it's um, uh, not possible to identify uh, technical information uh, from the uh, film strip itself, uh, like the edge marks or developing process. Um, uh, also, we use overscan to stabilize the image um, uh, in case uh, of damage perforation. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, um, uh, 9.5 uh, millimeter film stock uh, can be uh, set up in any way around due to single centered perforation. Therefore, there could be questionable places on, in uh, each film, uh, such as uh, mirrored uh, intertitles, for example, which we sometimes correct, uh, so we could read them. Um, in, a, uh, in our case, uh, uh, an hour scan uh, is also the closest digital uh, representation of the film where we do not apply any interpretation of ours. Uh, so for the archive, uh, I har um, uh, for the archival package, uh, we have two digital representation. First of them uh, is a raw scan without any interpretation. And the second one uh, is a master uh, with a different source uh, of technical or curator interventions. Uh, the film of each author must be judged individually and the decisions made on the basis of the context of his or her other work. Uh, all, all curated uh, interventions um, are documented in con uh, conservation report, which is uh, part of the archive package. Uh, on the slide, we can see the notch, uh, which uh, was specially uh, used for 9.5 millimeter film. Uh, cut out of uh, the film strip, uh, which was used to stop a single uh, single frame for several seconds in projection. Uh, it was used to spare some extra film during production, 
in a master, uh, we simulate stopping the projection by copying one, one single frame for several seconds. In some cases, the professional film uh, have double starts. It means that the, uh, the film contain uh, two identical introduction. Uh, in case one of them, uh, one of them uh, gets damaged uh, during the screening, it's possible to cut it out and uh, use second fresher one. We digitally remove uh, one of them from the master. Uh, next standard interventions uh, are cropping uh, the image and local stabilization of perforation. Uh, yes, so now I'm even without <laughs> anything. Uh, I hope it will return in a second. Uh, yeah, so... Um, uh, oh. Sorry, I'm just keeping uh, the, the, the chaos. Yeah, this is uh, what I mentioned, that, uh, that uh, we found the different information about the uh, about, like, edge marks and the material they were using. So this is a strip uh, of example, like uh, above we see all the uh, copied, uh, all the copied material and, what? And, uh, under it, we see the camera material, so it, it could be uh, positive, uh, which they used for creating the titles, because it, you can compare it to the negative next to it, uh, because it has different contrasts, so they used the black for, for, the, for the title, and also it was, uh, uh, I don't know, easy for them to do that, because uh, it's like only one process, and you can... Uh, um, you can draw uh, simple things, and they will just be uh, on a negative. Uh, uh, it it will it will create itself like uh, yeah. Uh, but um, but for example here, uh, yeah, you can also see that it's possible to to put the nine and a half millimeter all the way around. So uh, in in any direction, in any em emulsion outside inside. Uh, so you can see the. Like it's mirrored, so it's what uh, Zdenek uh, talking about that sometimes we uh, make the decision to mirror the the frame because uh, yeah because uh, uh, the titles for example are, are not readable, but also you can see the different uh, type of um, uh, used uh, material like uh, this film was uh, developed as a uh, reversal material, but here we see that it was. Um, uh, uh, developed as negative and copied to the to the positive film stock, and the same the same goes for for those types of material which is uh, negative uh, reversible film and undefined uh, film which could be used both as uh, uh, negative and reversal film. So. Uh, yeah, and uh, it wasn't possible to to have only one uh, only one uh, general name for the for what material was used because they used different types of material not only for the one film but through the whole reel. Uh, so uh, we decided to mark the precise place uh, where the uh, which uh, from cut to cut where precise material was used. So. Uh, it, it is a, sch a, sch a scheme uh, used for uh, pate uh, film stock. Uh, yeah, it also it also it, it also gives the possibility to write down the uh, edge all the edge marks uh, like text because uh, otherwise, uh, yeah, you, I mean uh, uh, some some film stocks are st standardized and uh, uh, you can know you know a lot of uh, they're described and you know a lot of information about them, but. Uh, for historical and uh, small format films, uh, there are not so much uh, description, so 
Uh, this is a scheme uh, which we use for describe the Pate uh, film stack, but also it can be used by uh, di different other film stacks. It doesn't matter uh, if uh, if uh, there isn't uh, some um, uh, I don't know some content for it. Uh, it's it's possible to say that it's 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 clear that there's not, it's, it's empty that there's nothing there. Uh, yeah, so that's another video. Um, yeah, and for example, yeah, so this is my um, uh, this is my point. Like uh, you have to tag uh, the with unique number for uh, inside one reel, uh, the start and the end, and then you can have the different uh, different elements uh, described in the in the text. And uh, for in in case of those uh, the. Uh, in case of this film, uh, the only mark was uh, a warning about it um, uh, uh, if it's uh, flammable. Uh, so we, uh, it, it was the uh, the one, uh, 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 the only way way to identify identify that it's uh, from Pate because uh, yeah. So we use. Uh, we use a general type of uh, film stock. Uh, wh what is it like reversible film? Then we say that it's Pate and uh, it's um, connected to our database. Uh, then we say that there's no information there, and then we say that uh, edge marks warning uh, is this text. So yeah, and and the developing process is reversible. Uh, in case of uh, I don't know different film, uh, uh, other film type um, a, a bit a bit different. Uh, it's possible to to have more information. So if there is uh, something filled, uh, which which can be yeah. So like their combination of letters, which we don't know yet what what it means or the number for the reversible film. So probably it could be some information of emulsion or the year it was made or something. Uh, but we're not sure yet, so uh, yeah. So we uh, put it also in this in this mark. And for example, if you have the film which is copied uh, to the from negative to positive, and you have uh, the edge marks from the previous uh, film stock which was used for it for this process, you can also add it to to this scheme. Uh, but we don't have the physically we don't have the film uh, at at archive, so we just put uh, the same um, the same uh, I don't know uh, values and uh, mention that it's uh, history that it's not uh, present uh, physically in uh, archive and uh, okay so it's <laughs> like for uh, yeah maybe it's a, a bit visible that for example here were used uh, for for film stocks uh, they were just reproducing the uh, the logo uh, of uh, pa uh, Pate, uh, but it was like made from several. You can see the um, uh, the signs from perforation of previous material, and uh, uh, the, and also this tag uh, gives you a possibility to, for example, to filter uh, what uh, values you want to use or you you want to analyze, uh, and you know the precise location of it. Uh, so, for example, if I would like to know everything about, uh, I don't know, like, Pate in general, or everything which is, uh, which was marked as uh, reversible material, or the reversal process, because sometimes it's, uh, the development process was a negative process, so I can uh, uh, filter it uh, and cut out the... Uh, 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 the precise fragments I need to compare, for example. So, yeah, so maybe it could be useful. And I think we end here. And uh, uh, thank you so much. And uh, sorry for the for the delay and and, and chaos. Yeah. Do we have any questions for our speakers? Uh, thank you. Um, Adela showed us a couple of the places where you show the materials that you have in the archive for the amateur film collection. Do you also make those publicly available? Oh, not yet. Are you planning to? We hope so. Uh, 
do you usually have the negatives or not? No, we don't. We don't. We have uh, only uh, the, res not, the. There's uh, some. Uh, of course, there is. Uh, we have, we have some some negatives, but they weren't copied, for example, ever or edited. But mostly, we have the. We work with positive or reversal uh, films, so we have only one. So the prints are mostly unique, after all. Yes. Yes. That's the point. Uh, I was just w wondering if uh, you could talk about the benefits of collecting this edge marking information, if you found opportunity to use it in access to the material, or if you drew any new conclusions about the material that you wouldn't, if you hadn't been gathering all this data. Yeah, um, uh, I mean, it's, the, it's, it's in the beginning. Uh, we're starting to do that, but uh, it was already, like, I'm curious if uh, there's some similarity in the emulsion which was uh, used or copied or, I don't know, like the, with the same properties uh, and parameters. But at the same time, um, uh, it's, it's also a contribution to, to those uh, filmmakers because they... Uh, uh, on our beautiful uh, video, which is not working, uh, there was a, uh, you know, like you, you see that they really use those tricks. So you, it's also a way to, uh, to write down uh, uh, the technique they used, uh, the process. So it was like, I don't know, like positive film stock for titles, uh, which was copied to the positive film stock and uh, through, uh, through the uh, image from negative with the, uh, uh, some fade out to black, you know. So, so it's like the 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 reason uh, we want to do that. But also, it's uh, a contribution to the uh, to Pate because it's 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 a possibility to uh, to write down the all the edge marks information. Thank you for the presentation. I have a quick question. Sometimes in the Kodak films you have squares, uh, dots, and triangles. I don't know if that is the case for Pate 2, and in that case, how do you record those uh, images? Uh, um, yeah, well, I'm not working with the uh, wide, uh, <laughs> like a uh, big film collection, uh, but, uh, but we record it uh, to some sort of conservator's note. If I'm right, I'm correct. Yeah. Great, so we'll get to the last question before we move on to our next presentation. Uh, fortunately, it's not a question, just a short remark. Uh, there's this great publication by the FIAF 2020 or 21, early um, aids for the identification of film stock from the BFI person from the 70s, 80s. I don't know if you're familiar, but it really helped me a lot to, for example, what she mentioned with the Kodak, what the triangles mean, you can identify when it was, where it was made, the stock, so it's a really great compendium. I can tell you later on, but it's on the <coughs> FIAF website. It's really very helpful. Okay, thank you so much. Great, can we get another round of applause for our speakers? <laughs> So we just have one more lightning talk before we move on to the break. Uh, Jonas Vatos uh, towards a Czech digital games preservation. Um, hi, I'm Jonas Vatos from Národní filmový archiv. I know that coffee is waiting, so I'll try to keep the the presentation as short as possible, and I'm not going to use PowerPoint. Uh, I, I want to use this version. Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, a, a project of ours about uh, for uh, preservation of Czech video games. Uh, the project is still in its first year, so we don't even have a, a proper name for the community. So uh, we still have this very, very long name for the project application. But the project timeline is uh, 2023 till 2028. Uh, it, the project is the participation of the project is a consortium of three subjects. Narodní filmový archiv for the archival part, film and TV school in uh, the Academy of Performing Arts for the curation, mainly uh, game design department, 
and also the Institute for Intermedia in Czech Tec Technical University for the te Technical Solution. Uh, uh, the motivation for actually doing this, uh, regarding that we are a film archive, we have still a lot of unprocessed films, why do we gonna do games? So the thing is that the Czech Film Fund, which subsidizes uh, Czech films, is going to transform into audiovisual fund, which go is going to subsidize also other types of works, including games. Therefore, as for the Czech law, the subsidies is, are directly linked to the legal deposit. Therefore, we had to come up with a solution how to actually archive those games with the intent to actually build a proper gaming collection uh, on the framework of this project. Uh, so the project parameters as of now, this might change in the future, because as I said, we are still in the first year, is that we have about, uh, we have about 100 games uh, released between uh, early 90s, uh, early 80s, still uh, present time on various platforms, including like ZX Spectrum, Amigas, but also PlayStation and PC also. We have decided we are not going to collect any hardware as for we as we don't have any facilities for it, and uh, also regarding to the fact that there is a vibrant uh, amateur collect collectors community, we are going to probably uh, outsource those, or they already have the hardware, so we're not going to ingest it into, into our institution. Rather, we are trying to uh, come up with an emulation solution for the games to be playable without any... Um, any means of installing anything, basically in the browser. And we are also going to preserve the game session recordings from those. We are still not sure if we are going, going to preserve every session recording or just the curator ones. We'll see about that. Um, as for the cooperation, we are in the... Uh, we have formally uh, contacted or we are in the contact of the Game Developer Association, which, which is a Czech institution. And we also are in the cooperation with Internationale Computersammlung, which is a, an association of German uh, institutions collecting video games. Uh, we are looking to co uh, potential cooperation within Software Preservation Network, which we are not part of. Um, and given that those are specialists in this field, we will probably do something. Uh, if anybody here is uh, connected with this, Network, please let me know, and I have lots of questions about it. And also, maybe we, we, we should do something in a FIAF in the longer term, So, but we'll, we'll see about that. As for the technology, we know that regarding the non-PC platforms, we need to use emulation. Uh, there are There is some prior art in a sense of framework which are actually able to emulate the, the, the hardware, as for the PC games, we are looking into virtualizing uh, the games themselves either through proper virtualization, like you know VMware, KVM, or containers. Uh, we have some some prototypes, but still we'll, we'll we'll see how will it end up. We are looking into actually uh, replacing Windows licenses with Wine or Proton, and yeah, uh, the, the the resulting archival package will go to the OIES system. Yeah, uh, these are, th there's only a couple of screenshots that we have some prototypes. We have a Mafia running in the browser. We have Bulance running in the browser, which is actually a very weird game where you become, a, uh, what's the English name for it? Uh, a pillow and you kill other pillows. Yeah. <laughs> we also have some schemes about the workflow, uh, which we're going to use, but those are still in the very early research phases. And we also have a very complex uh, metadata schema, which which is taken or taken, uh, which was given uh, to us uh, very generously f by the Internationale Computer Sammlung. Uh, we have lots of unsolved questions, of course. What about licensing games, even in the research access? We are still not sure uh, how will it work. We don't know what to do with the notion of patches and versions in the age of digital distributions like Steam or um, Epic Game Store and stuff. And we still don't know how are we going to present the user-generated content in the, in, the, in, the, in the games themselves. And also massive multiplayer games 
are currently not able to be preserved yet. So we'll see about that. Or we are probably not going to do those. <laughs> And uh, just a quick remark that we are actually going to make a conference about this project in a year or so here also, uh, also and the, 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 the themes will be about prior art, about case studies of our pre-existing pre pre projects and about the technical solutions. Yeah, that's all. Uh, please reach out if you have any comments or suggestions and uh, we'll be happy. I'll, I'll be happy personally to, 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 to hear them. Thank you. We have some time before the uh, coffee break for questions. Hi, Jonas. Thank you for that uh, impressive workflow. Um, can you, um, is part of the project, because you're, you're sort of showing a lot of the, the technical approaches to emulating the, the games themselves, are you also planning in the project to do you know, lower level, like, f Keeping, keeping, um, you know, Twitch streams of run-throughs of, of video games, or asking people to come uh, to come and play and record that as a as as one of the ways to sort of preserve the experience of a game. Yeah. So far, we only agreed on the preservation of the recordings, which uh, will be done in the in the sense of the project or the on, in the like safe space of some like station. Uh, I'm not sure about the Twitch content. It's also a matter of like you actually have to catalog it and do all this stuff behind it. So there are some already existing solutions but done by the community. There are some websites and stuff. Uh, so we will probably let them do it. So we have time at least to do this part of the project and then we'll see how will it end up in the future. Um, hey, maybe you, you said it, but in the games you have, uh, some of them are from the 80s. So do you have them on console or it's all computer game? Well, most of the 80s games are already preserved or like at least digitized. We do have the data files for them. But still we do have some of those which we don't have. So we'll have to preserve them from the original floppy disks and stuff. But most of the games are actually, uh, we have them already in the digital form, like, okay. so, yeah, it's readily a playable in the emulation right now. Okay. For, uh, the, these games are the simplest one to, 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 to do so far. It's just to say we have a, a game uh, um, collection and we are recording also people from the community that have the console or the old computers at home and they are just playing the game on the original computer, and this is what we preserve at the end, because we can't have all the console. So, but this is really cool to connect with all the communities of those super fan of those uh, consoles, and it was a very nice project for us. Uh, th that's one of the recent discussions in the team, of course. Hi, um, so we've talked a little bit about amateur film and um, other presentations. Um, I'm curious, uh, two branches of sort of amateur game making, um, mods to games. Uh, so I played Mafia, so I know quite a bit about the mods scene there. And also uh, amateur game making. So, you know, people that didn't go for a larger public release, but at least just released it online. Uh, where did those fall within the thinking of this project? I, I know it's beyond the scope, but you know, have conversations come up? Well, as for the ontology, uh, the mods are the manifestation of the game, so we shall preserve them as its own manifestation. And the amateur games, like most of the 80s games, are actually amateur games, and these are part of the sample. Thanks. Great, can we give Jonas and the rest of our speakers a round of applause? I believe there's coffee waiting outside now, and we're back in this room at uh, 10 past the hour.